We're back with another episode of Who's Your Mets and Legends. I'm Rebecca Wilhelm. I'm Mary Quigley. And I'm Hope Wilhelm. Join us as we dive into the spookier side of the Hoosier State. So what comes to your mind when you think of Indiana? Do you think of corn? Do you think of basketball? Do you think of the Indianapolis 500? Maybe you think of famous celebrities who were born in Indiana, like John Mellencamp or Michael Jackson. But as the saying goes, there was more than corn in Indiana. 92 counties make up the Hoosier State. In this podcast, we are going to discuss some Indiana folklore from each of these counties. If you are into tall tales, ghosts, or spooky legends, then this is a podcast you are not going to want to miss. Hey everyone, this is Becky, and I'm here with our second creepy story. This one is a favorite of mine by American author Mark Twain. And this story is a part of a collection of short stories in a book called Sketches New and Old that was first published in 1875. Mark Twain was born, Samuel Clemens, in 1835 in Florida, Missouri. He chose Mark Twain as his pen name because it was a riverboat term that was used to measure the water's depth. This makes sense because he grew up on the Mississippi River in Hannibal, Missouri. A mark meant six feet and Twain meant two. So at the time, saying Mark Twain meant it was safe for steamships at the time to pass. Twain had spent a few years before the Civil War working as a steamboat captain. Most people know his children's books, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. A fact that I always love to share with my own students about this fascinating author is that he was born after Halley's Comet made an appearance in 1835. Now, because of this, Twain felt that once this comet made an appearance again, that it would mean the end for him. And he was strangely right about this, passing away in 1910, shortly after the comet's appearance that year. A ghost story starts off as a very spooky tale. And in true Twain fashion, it has a humorous twist. And I hope that you will enjoy his satire as much as I always do. So turn the lights low, sit back, relax, and get ready to enjoy Mark Twain's A Ghost Story. A Ghost Story by Mark Twain. I took a large room far up Broadway in a huge old building whose upper stories had been wholly unoccupied for years until I came. The place had long been given up to dust and cobwebs, to solitude and silence. I seemed groping among the tombs and invading the privacy of the dead that first night I climbed up to my quarters. For the first time in my life, a superstitious dread came over me. And as I turned, a dark angle of the stairway and an invisible cobweb swung its lazy woof in my face and clung there. I shuddered as one who had encountered a phantom. I was glad enough when I reached my room and locked out the mold and the darkness. A cheery fire was burning in the grate, and I sat down before it with a comforting sense of relief. For two hours, I sat there thinking of bygone times, recalling old scenes and summoning half-forgotten faces out of the mists of the past, listening in fancy to voices that long ago grew silent for all time and to once familiar songs that nobody sings now. And as my reverie softened down to a sadder and sadder pathos, the shrieking of the winds outside softened to a wail, the angry beating of the rain against the panes diminished to a tranquil patter, 
and one by one, the noises in the streets subsided until the hurrying footsteps of the last belated straggler died away in the distance and left no sound behind. The fire had burned low. A sense of loneliness crept over me. I arose and undressed, moving on tiptoe about the room, doing stealthily what I had to do, as if I were environed by sleeping enemies, whose slumbers it would be fatal to break. I covered up in bed and lay listening to the rain and wind and the faint creaking of distant shutters till they lulled me to sleep. I slept profoundly, but how long I do not know. All at once, I found myself awake and filled with shuddering expectancy. All was still, all but my own heart. I could hear it beat. Presently, the bedclothes began to slip away slowly toward the foot of the bed, as if someone were pulling them. I could not stir. I could not speak. Still, the blanket slipped deliberately away till my breast was uncovered. Then, with great effort, I seized them and drew them over my head. I waited, listened, waited. Once more, that steady pool began, and once more I lay torpid, a century of dragging, seconds, till my breast was naked again. At last, I aroused my energies and snatched the covers back to their place and held them with a strong grip. I waited. By and by, I felt a faint tug and took a fresh grip. The tug strengthened to a steady strain. It grew stronger and stronger. My hold parted, and for the third time, the blanket slid away. I groaned. An answering groan came from the foot of the bed. Beaded drops of sweat stood upon my forehead. I was more dead than alive. Presently, I heard a heavy footstep in my room. The step of an elephant, it seemed to me. It was not like anything human, but it was moving from me. There was relief in that. I heard it approach the door, pass out without moving bolt or lock, and wander away among the dismal corridors, straining the floors and joists till they creaked again as it passed, and then silence reigned once more. When my excitement had calmed, I said to myself, this is a dream, simply a hideous dream. And so I lay thinking it over until I convinced myself that it was a dream. And then a comforting laugh relaxed my lips, and I was happy again. I got up and struck a light, And when I found that the locks and bolts were just as I had left them, another soothing laugh welled in my heart and rippled from my lips. I took my pipe and lit it, and it was just setting down before the fire. When down went the pipe of my nerveless fingers, the blood forsook my cheeks, and my placid breathing was cut short with a gasp. In the ashes of the hearth, side by side, with my own bare footprint, was another, so vast that in comparison mine was but an infant's. Then I had, had a visitor, and the elephant tread was explained. I put out the light and returned to bed. Palsied with fear, I lay a long time peering into the darkness and listening. Then I heard a grating noise overhead like the dragging of a heavy body across the floor. Then the throwing down of the body and the shaking of my windows in response to the concussion. In distant parts of the building, I heard the muffled slamming of doors. I heard, at intervals, stealthy footsteps creeping in and out among the corridors and up and down the stairs. Sometimes these noises approached my door, hesitated, and went away again. I heard the clanking of chains faintly in remote passages and listened while the clanking grew nearer. While it wearily climbed the stairways, marking each move by the loose surplus of chain that fell with an accented rattle upon each succeeding step as the goblin that bore it advanced. I heard muttered sentences, half-uttered screams that seemed smothered violently, and the swish of invisible garments, the rush of invisible wings. Then I became conscious that my chamber was invaded, that I was not alone. I heard sighs and breathing about my bed and mysterious whisperings. Three little spheres of soft, fluorescent light appeared on the ceiling directly over my head, clung and glowed there a moment, and then dropped. Two of them upon my face and one upon the pillow. They spattered liquidly and felt warm. Intuition told me they had turned to gouts of blood as they fell. 
I needed no light to satisfy myself of that. Then I saw pallid faces, dimly luminous and white uplifted hands, floating bodiless in the air, floating a moment and then disappearing. The whispering eased and the voices and the sounds and a solemn stillness followed. I waited and listened. I felt that I must have light or die. I was weak with fear. I slowly raised myself toward a sitting posture and my face came in contact with a clammy hand. All strength went from me, apparently, and I fell back like a stricken invalid. Then I heard the rustle of a garment. It seemed to pass to the door and go out. And we'll be back with more A Ghost Story by Mark Twain when we return. Hey everyone, if you haven't heard the news already, we wrote a book. Haunted Dearborn County, Indiana is coming to all major retailers August 14th, 2023. Strange and unusual things lurk behind the calm facade of Dearborn County. Several legends surround the Hill Forest Mansion, the home of one of Aurora's founding families. Many have seen the ghost of a farmer and his mule at Carnegie Hall in Moores Hill. The glowing grave at Riverview Cemetery may connect to the 1941 Agru family massacre. St. Mary's Church Rectory is said to be haunted by the former priest, and the spirits at Whiskey's in Lawrenceburg are not just in the drinks. Several schools in the area echo with the sounds of former students and staff, and numerous local residences house the spirits of former owners who have never left. Join Rebecca and I on a chilling tour from Lawrenceburg to Lawrenceville and beyond. Haunted Dearborn County, Indiana is available for pre-order. Check out HoosierMissingLegends.com for more details. When everything was still once more, I crept out of bed, sick and feeble, and lit the gas with a hand that trembled. As if it were aged with a hundred years, the light brought some little cheer to my spirits. I sat down and fell into a dreamy contemplation of that great footprint in the ashes. By and by, its outlines began to waver and grow dim. I glanced up and the broad gas flame was slowly wilting away. In the same moment, I heard that elephantine tread again. I noted its approach nearer and nearer along the musty halls and dimmer and dimmer the lights waned. The tread reached my very door and paused. The light had dwindled to a stickly blue and all things about me lay in a spectral twilight. The door did not open and yet I felt a faint gust of air fan my cheek and presently was conscious of a huge cloudy presence before me. I watched it with fascinated eyes. A pale glow stole over the thing. Gradually, its cloudy folds took shape. An arm appeared, then legs, then a body, and at last a great sad face looked out on the vapor. Stripped of its flimly housings, naked, muscular, and calmly, the majestic Cardiff giant loomed above me. All my misery vanished, for a child might know that no harm could come with that benignant countenance. My cheerful spirits returned at once, and in sympathy with them, the gas flamed up brightly again. Never a lonely outcast was so glad to welcome company as I was to greet the friendly giant. I said, why is it nobody but you? Do you know? I have been scared to death for the last two or three hours. I am most honestly glad to see you. I wish I had a chair. Here, here, don't try to sit down in that thing. It was too late. He was in it before I could stop him, and down he went. I never saw a chair shivered so in my life. Stop, stop, you'll ruin ev. Too late again, there was another crash, and another chair was resolved into its original elements. Confound it. Haven't you got any judgment at all? Do you want to ruin all the furniture in the place? Here, here, you petrified fool, but it was no use. Before I could arrest him, he had his set down on the bed, and it was a melancholy ruin. Now what sort of way is that to do? First you come lumbering about the place, bringing a legion of vagabond goblins along with you to worry me to death, and then when I overlook an indelicacy of costume which would not be tolerated anywhere by cultivated people except in a respectable theater, and not even there if the nudity were of your sex, 
You repay me by wrecking all the furniture you can find to sit down on. And why will you? You damage yourself as much as you do me. You've broken off the end of your spinal column and littered up the floor with chips of your hams till the place looks like a marble yard. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You are big enough to know better. Well, I will not break any more furniture, but what am I to do? I have not had a chance to sit down for a century. And tears came into his eyes. Poor devil, I said. I should not have been so harsh with you. And you are an orphan too, no doubt. But sit down on the floor here. Nothing else can stand your weight. And besides, we cannot be sociable with you away up there, way above me. I want you down where I can perch on this high coming house stool and gossip with you face to face. So he sat down on the floor and lit up a pipe, which I gave him, threw one of my red blankets over his shoulders, inverted my sits bath on his head, helmet fashion, and made himself picturesque and comfortable. Then he crossed his ankles when I renewed the fire and exposed the flat honeycomb bottoms of his prestigious feet to the grateful warmth. What is the matter with the bottom of your feet and the back of your legs that they are gouged up so? Infernal chilblains. I caught them clear up to the back of my head, roasting out there under the Newell's farm. But I love the place. I love it as one loves his old home. There is no peace for me like the peace I feel when I am there. We talked along for half an hour, and then I noticed that he looked tired and spoke of tired, he said. When I should think so, and now I will tell you all about it, since you've treated me so well. I am the spirit of the petrified man that lies across the street here in the museum. I am the ghost of the Cardiff giant. I can have no rest, no peace, till they have given that poor body burial again. Now, what was the most natural thing for me to do to make men satisfy this wish? terrify them into it haunt the place where the body lay so i haunted the museum night after night i even got other spirits to help me but it did no good for nobody ever came to the museum at midnight then it occurred to me to come over way and haunt this place a little i felt that if i ever got a hearing i must succeed for i had the most efficient company that perdition could furnish night after night we have shivered around through these milled halls, dragging chains, groaning, whispering, tramping up and down stairs, till, to tell you the truth, I'm almost worn out. But when I saw light in your room tonight, I roused my energies again and went at it with a deal of the old freshness. But I'm tired out, entirely fagged out. Give me, I beseech you, give me some hope. I lit off my perch in a burst of excitement and exclaimed, this transcends everything everything that ever did occur why you poor blundering old fossil you've had all your trouble for nothing you've been haunting a plaster cast of yourself the real cardiff giant is in albany confound it don't you know your own remains i never saw such an eloquent look of shame of pitiful humiliation overspread in a countenance before the petrified man rose slowly to his feet and said, Honestly, is that true? As true as I'm sitting here. He took the pipe from his mouth and laid it on the mantel, then stood irresolute a moment, unconsciously from old habit, thrusting his hands where his pantaloons pockets should have been, meditatively dropping his chain on his breast, and finally said, well, I never felt so absurd before. The petrified man has sold everybody else, and now the mean fraud has ended by selling its own ghost. My son, if there's any charity left in your heart for a poor, friendless phantom like me, don't let this get out. Think how you would feel if you had made such an ass of yourself. I heard his stately tramp die away, step by step down the stairs and out into the deserted street. I felt sorry that he was gone. Poor fellow, and sorrier still that he had carried off my red blanket and my bathtub. So here's an interesting footnote by Twain. A fact, the original fraud was ingeniously and fraudulently duplicated and exhibited in New York as the only genuine Cardiff giant to the unspeakable disgust of the owners of the real Colossus. At the very same time, that letter was drawing crowds at a museum in Albany. 
We hope you enjoyed hearing a ghost story by Mark Twain. Let us know what you thought by leaving a comment on one of our social media pages. Do you know of any creepy public domain stories that we should share? Or are you an author who'd like to share your work on our podcast? We would love to hear from you. Please send an email to Legends at gmail.com or contact us on social media. We may use it in a future episode. Let us know if you wish to remain anonymous. source material, please visit our website, HoosierMissingLegends.com. Please find us and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and now Twitter. Hoosier Missing Legends is a Quigley Productions podcast. Our theme song was written and recorded by Wet Blanket. The song title is Taxidermy Race Car. As always, stay spooky.